Well, hello everybody. My name is Mirbat Al Asnaj. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and I'm here with PCR Online to present to you some of the late-breaking clinical trials at ACC 2024. And we're going to be discussing the impact MI trial today uh, with the prime principal investigator, uh, Professor Javid Butler, who is the president of the Baylor Scott and White Research Institute and senior vice president of the Baylor Scott and White Health. He's also a distinguished professor of medicine at the University of Mississippi in Jackson, Mississippi. So Professor Butler, welcome to PCR Online. Thank you very much. I'm coming to you actually from the convention center in Atlanta. So glad to be with you. Thank you. So, you know, patients with acute myocardial infarction are at risk for developing heart failure and consequently have a higher rate of mortalities. So drugs such as the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors have been proven to improve outcomes in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, um, such as in the case of empagliflozin, um, but even with preserved heart, uh, preserved LVEF. But their efficacy in a special population post-myocardial infarction has not yet been adequately evaluated. And the, so the objective, my understanding of the impact of my trial was to assess that and to evaluate the safety and efficacy of empagliflozin compared with placebo in patients who are hospitalized with MI and at or higher risk of onset of heart failure, um, in addition to, of course, the standard of care. So I understand that this is a very large multicentric trial, and if you could walk us through the design of impact MI. Yeah, uh, certainly. So, you know, as you mentioned, patients post myocardial infarction are at a high risk of death, and although they can die of various causes, the two big ones are obviously complications of MI and then development of heart failure. So in terms of the recurrent MI risk, and the acute complications of MI, we have seen a speed change, right? All the interventional procedures that you all do, the systems of care, the dose to balloon time, lipids, statins, uh, 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 dual interplatelet therapy. Uh, but the heart failure side, we haven't really had a drug in the past 20 years to, to reduce the risk. So that was the question. The primary endpoint was all cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. Uh, it was a very broad inclusion criteria. So. STEMI, non-STEMI, diabetes, no diabetes, all comers, uh, within the first 14 days of uh, diagnosis of MI. Uh, so relatively soon, uh, but at the most 14 days out. Randomized to empagliflozin in 10 milligrams or placebo, and uh, uh, otherwise a standard of uh, care uh, therapy for these patients. And on top of that, we require some, so those patients who already had history of heart failure, uh, they were uh, excluded. So these are patients not with heart failure, but on admission, either they had a new drop in ejection fraction to less than 45 or had signs symptoms of congestion requiring treatment and some additional uh, enrichment factors. And then they were followed. The only other thing I would mention about the study design, which becomes sort of a little bit important in study uh, result interpretation, is that this was a pragmatic streamlined trial. We really, really wanted to lower the burden on the patients and the family caregivers and the sites. Uh, so the inclusion exclusion criteria, as I said, were very broad. The data that we collected were sort of, you know, the only the most important data that we needed. So the it was in very detailed CRFs. Uh, on top of that, we did not have any central adjudication. Uh, so these were all site-based adjudication, and that's why we did not have cardiovascular mortality uh, as a primary endpoint, but all cause mortality. And we did not have outpatient heart failure data. So these are all sort of the streamlined uh, trial uh, perspective as well. So, you know, other uh, trials in the setting of acute MI have been published in the last decade or so um, that looked at guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure. You know, some of the most prominent of those were the acute infarction ramipril efficacy trial, and then more contemporary were the Valiant and Paradise. Uh, MI trial. So how does impact MI compare to those studies that have been previously published on this subset of patients? Yeah, so the, the, the most recent, obviously, is the Paradise MI trial with ARNI, uh, and then the DAPA MI trial, which was presented last year. So now the DAPA MI trial, uh, the main way our trial refers is that uh, that trial excluded patients with type 2 diabetes, or we included patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, but the biggest thing is that uh, for logistic reasons, 
the aims of that trial was changed from a mortality morbidity uh, to a seven point cardiometabolic endpoint, and there were not enough clinical endpoints to make any sort of definitive conclusion. Comparing to the ARNI trial, uh, our trial was actually in broad sense uh, pretty comparable to the Paradise MI trial. And in your opinion, does it matter if you are looking at a superiority design versus a non-inferiority design in these kind of patients? Yeah, so the non-inferiority design sort of comes up if there is a head-to-head -head comparison, and this is a replacement strategy, not an add-on strategy. So for instance, that's what Paradigm HF was, their RNA was compared to ACE inhibitors, wasn't an add-on strategy, or for instance, you have two different antiplatelet therapies or something like that here because we are talking about incremental benefit on top of standard of care, then superiority design becomes pretty important. And some of these trials evaluated ejection fraction and other clinical heart failure um, trials, you know, really looked at clinical symptomatology in these patients rather than an absolute number of ejection fraction. Um, what do you think is more valuable when we're risk stratifying post-MI patients specifically? Yeah, so I mean, I would think that the more data we look at it and depending on what definitions we use for signs and symptoms and how much congestion and how much drop in ejection fraction, whether one is more important or the other is more important can probably flip and flop between different studies at the end of the day. I think both things are, are important and both things are graded. So if somebody has, you know, uh, uh, you know, trace fetal edema and is not short of breath is different than somebody who's, you know, have uh, uh, ROS in the lungs and is really short of breath at breath. And similarly, somebody's EF is 48% versus, you know, 28% after a myocardial infarction. Uh, that probably also makes a difference. I mean, you know, in, I, I don't know the international literature, maybe, maybe you would know the literature, whether stun myocardium and total recoverability on its own, just with revascularization, even that differs with how much the initial drop in EF was or not. I would think that the initial quote unquote stun myocardium uh, or, or what we think is a stun myocardium, if it's, you know, 42, it may recover more than if it is, you know, 20, but, but I don't know that for sure. So I think it is time to ask you the most important question, which is what were the findings of the impact of my trial? Yeah, so unfortunately, we did not meet the primary endpoint, which was all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization. There was a 10% relative risk reduction uh, with a p-value of 0.21. Now, if we dissect the primary endpoint into its component, there was no statistically significant difference in all-cause mortality, but there was a 23% reduction in the risk of heart failure hospitalization, which is not only directionally, but even in magnitude, pretty comparable than what we have learned from other SGLT inhibitor trials in CKD and heart failure and in diabetes. And if you look at not the time to first heart failure hospitalization, but total heart failure hospitalization, first and recurrent combined, also highly statistically significant 33% relative risk reduction as well. Now, I mentioned to you that, you know, we did this pragmatic trial. We did not really collect, uh, uh, adjudicate the data. We did not have outpatient heart failure in the primary endpoint. On the other hand, outpatient heart failure is becoming more common, but also remember the earlier two years of our trial was done in the thick of COVID. This trial started in 2020. And also during the trial, there were two regional wars, both in uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, and also in uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia started. And, and these were sites in the trial as well. So we were a little bit concerned about missing the development of heart failure in our trial. But luckily enough, heart failure data were also collected as an adverse event, which included heart failure hospitalization, heart failure-related mortality, and outpatient heart failure. So not as part of the primary endpoint, but as part of uh, uh, adverse events. So when we look at the endpoint, not based on heart failure hospitalization, but all heart failure events, then the relative risk reduction was 37%, highly statistically significant, and actually, all cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization also was statistically significant. So then we wanted to sort of pressure test the results a little bit more and say, well, you know, what are the chances that you went, left the hospital, not on heart failure medications, you don't have heart failure diagnosis, but post discharge, you got started on heart failure uh, medication. So new RNA use, new any RAS inhibitor use, new MRA use, 
new diuretic use, all of those were substantially less, about 25, 28% relative risk reduction in those patients that were on empagliflozin. Uh, 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 so if you put sort of all of these data together, and then we did a meta-analysis of all trials with SGLT2 inhibitors, and it turns out that the heart failure risk reduction is pretty much exactly on dot that we have seen with any other trial which then leads to sort of the biggest fundamental question that if heart failure is one of the worst prognostic signs post-MI and you have a 25-30% reduction in heart failure hospitalization, why is the mortality result neutral, right? That's sort of the biggest question that I think people will, will argue with. So I can give you my perspective. Remember, I've been looking at these data for like three weeks nonstop. So I may be biased and, and other people can judge, the, judge whether my explanation makes sense or not. But at least the way I am looking at it is that very early post-MI mortality uh, has nothing to do with SGLT2 inhibitor, right? So, I mean, if you have stent thrombosis and, you know, uh, acute arrhythmias and ruptures and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you know, SGLT2 inhibitors could not do it. The average time to development of heart failure was about three months, four months, something like that. And the average follow-up after heart failure development was shy of a year. So we only had about 53 deaths in those patients. So I use my best interpretation is that post heart failure, we did not have long enough follow up and we did not have enough events to make any definitive comment in that respect. You know, you did mention some important subgroups like patients with kidney chronic kidney disease and so on. Were there any subgroup analyses done from the impact MI? And if so, um, what were we did a ton of subgroup analysis. The heart failure signal was very consistent. The only place where there was an interaction, and by interaction, I mean that both men and women benefited, but there was less of a beneficial signal in women and more in men. So we need to sort of understand that a little bit. My best guess is that this is not seen in any SGLD2 inhibitor, and it's probably noise, but we can look at it. We, we, we will do a full sex-based paper because what I don't know is whether sex is the representative of maybe more non-STEMI, maybe more this, maybe more that, what exactly is that we're trying to understand. But again, I want to highlight that it wasn't that there was no benefit, but there was an interaction high benefit. Otherwise, it was straight through, doesn't really matter what subgroup you're looking at, you, you, you saw benefit in all groups. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the sex differences, but I do believe the enrollment of women was in the in the range of 25% or so. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and that is, you know, both the minority enrollment and women enrollment, you know, we we sort of, uh, I, I don't know what the solution is, uh, and uh, it probably will continue to be iterated, but, uh, you know, there's so much effort that goes into it, uh, but there are so many social reasons for which women and minorities enroll less in trial, and we really have to work, work hard on it uh, to, to, to bring it to more equitable. Yeah, so you're exactly right. We had about 75% men and about 25% women. So, you know, before we um, close off, I want to ask you personally, um, how would you treat an acute MI patient with LV dysfunction today based on these studies and based on impact MI? I mean, to me, the interpretation is pretty simple. Remember that the alpha or the p-value of 0.21 is for this trial. The alpha or the p-value for heart failure prevention comes from Bayesian borrowing from like 10 other trials on over 100,000 patients showing exactly the same results. So at least in my interpretation of the data, and these are not some, you know, minor squeak in p-value with a, you know, relative risk reduction of 10%. These are 25 to 30% relative risk reduction in heart failure that I would think that people who are coming into the hospital who in general are at high cardiometabolic risk to begin with and may have other indications, but if they meet the criteria of the impact MI trial, I would personally use SQLT2 inhibitors in those, in those patients. And how soon would you start them post-MI? So that's an interesting question because the safety of SGLT2 inhibitors have been documented for a very long time in a lot of trials. But in this particular trial, safety was of a special concern because uh, in the other trials, you don't have a new MI, blood pressure changes, cardiac cath, IV contrast, and new RAS inhibitor, and new MRA, and then SGLT2 inhibitor, right? So basically, the bottom line is that we had no signal of increased risk of AKI uh, 
no signal of renal safety, and none of the other were significantly different than what we know about LGLT2 inhibitor uh, overall. So I would say that we have learned quite a lot that once the patient is stable, the sooner you start, the better it is. We will do more analysis. We really haven't dug into the timing data just right yet, uh, but at least within the first couple of weeks is, I think, pretty reasonable. Now, if somebody's in the emergency room and you don't know whether they're going to get into shock or something bad is going to happen, uh, I don't think it's, a, it's that sort of an emergent that you have to give them before you take them to the cath lab. But within the first few days, seems very reasonable. And my final question to you, do you think MPACTMI will change the guidelines? So I don't know. I mean, I think it depends on the people writing the guidelines, right? So if the people writing to the guidelines are very frequentist, p-value-based interpretation that in this particular trial, uh, although the subgroup analysis makes sense, uh, but the primary endpoint was negative, so we are not going to consider that's one way of looking at it. Alternative way of looking at it uh, is that uh, now, gosh, we have, you know, uh, 15 trials showing the same 15% relative risk reduction. So if you're a Bayesian, you will give a good recommendation and guidelines. If you're a frequentist, you don't. I have no idea what the mindset of guideline writers are. Yeah, absolutely. I think you put that very elegantly. Well, thank you, Professor Butler. And I want to thank PCR Online viewers. Stay with us for more late-breaking trials from PCR Online. <laughs>